Our next uh, speaker, we are now again moving to a different technology to 3D scanning. Alex Tokovinin is a specialist of Mayan archaeology, Mesoamerican writing systems and epigraphy. He has extensive experience with 3D scanning, technical illustration and documentation of inscriptions and teaching. So we are now also bringing another usage case of, of these imaging technologies into place. Alex received his PhD from Harvard University's Department of Anthropology in 2008. He is currently a teaching uh, a lecturer <coughs> at the Harvard's Department of Anthropology and in addition he's a research associate for the Corpus of Maya hieroglyphic inscriptions at the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. He has also been a research associate in Maya studies in the pre-Columbian program at Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, D.C. In 2013, Alexander was awarded the College Art Association Alfred E. Bar Jr. Award for an especially distinguished catalog in the history of art as a co-editor and contributor to the catalog of ancient Maya art at Dumbarton Oaks. So we are going to move not only to a completely different technology, but also now looking more probably from the users, with the user side, into these new imaging technologies. Please welcome Alex. So uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of this amazing event for their kind invitation. Uh, uh, welcome everyone who is here. And uh, so I'm going to take you a little bit to a different uh, part of the world, to Mesoamerica. So we're in pre-Columbian Central America, the present day Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and Honduras. And we're going to talk about um, my uh, uh, project as part of this larger effort to document uh, endangered Maya monuments. So I work for the Corpus of Maya inscriptions directed by Barbara Fash. And uh, our job is essentially to facilitate the decipherment of Maya text, to facilitate the study of Maya text, but also to document, to preserve this amazing uh, heritage, the only pre-Columbian civilization with an extensive corpus of texts before the Spanish conquest. So our only vision to what these people actually said about each other well before they met any European or Spaniard. So it's a remarkably important piece of data and it needs documentation and preservation. And these are two of most obvious examples why we need to document things. So the example above is primarily about natural erosion, but also bad conservation decisions, which we cannot reverse. Uh, all we can do is uh, stabilize. But you can see a tremendous amount of damage to the surface of a text uh, a monument uh, from uh, Honduras just within about a century since its discovery. Uh, the example below is perhaps even more unfortunate because it's about looting and vandalism. So what happened to a monument when a bunch of guys uh, with power drills decided to loot it and uh, just broke it into multiple pieces. So these are the realities. Uh, humans and nature are sort of against us. It's a race against time, against uh, fellow human beings to preserve this cultural heritage, uh, something we just need to do. Uh, why we need to scan things as opposed to, say, other modes, other forms of documentation. Sometimes the objects are large and they're hard to measure. Sometimes the access is very restricted. Objects can be also fragile. Uh, sometimes we just want to share them better. Uh, digital files are much easier to share than physical objects. Uh, we may want to make copies, to make replicas. Uh, and once again, we have 3D printers and milling machines to do that. And the cost is comparatively lower uh, than bringing the actual objects or even traditional plaster casts. Uh, we can also measure, draw, study these things. We, create, we can create virtual reconstructions and representations, once again, to facilitate the use not only for research, but also for public engagement. And uh, this is very important for the museums. And I work for a museum. We constantly think about how we can make our enormous collection somehow a little more accessible uh, to people who come to our museum, who use our museum, and uh, who have no access to our enormous storage. We can only show a tiny, tiny fraction of what we have. And that's a typical reality for any museum, I believe. Um, so photographs versus 3D scanning. Of course, this is a bit of a dramatic example. But uh, photography has its limitations. And, and this uh, case, you, 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 know, you photograph it in the field. Sometimes you have no control of 
a distance from an object. So this photograph on the left has been taken from not an optimal distance. The distortion caused by the lens is pretty obvious here. Um, so uh, if you want a, an ortho image, a representation that actually re uh, corresponds to the geometry of the object, uh, 3D scans are much better. You can also see these things better than any raking light photograph. Of course, there we have uh, RTI and other techniques uh, which can compensate for that. But just for now, um, even a small section of this text actually illustrates the benefits of uh, the imaging. So you can see in a 3D scan rendering, all those details uh, that the field drawing and the photograph perhaps fail to represent can be seen more clearly. You may ask, why, why do we need all that stuff? Well, it's an actual inscription. It talks about a particular king. It just happens to be that very moment when the whole regional politics and the entirety of the Maya lowlands was about to change. So we just center on one single glyph. Whether or not this eroded piece is more like this or more like that essentially determines whether the king uh, claims a throne of a nearby uh, city-state of Naranjo or he just happens to be the, gra the maternal grandson of a ruler from Shultun. We know that within 20 years, all the alliances in this area would be completely realigned. This particular king would die in battle and uh, the largest hegemonic state or a loose empire would emerge in the Maya lowlands within a century. So it's highly important to understand the original network of alliances at the time when this was about to start, when this process of unification of Maya uh, kingdoms was about to begin. So it all depends on this single glyph. And of course, we want to be able, as a figure first, and I'm talking as a user, of course, here, to visualize the 3D topography of this incredibly eroded monument in as many ways as possible to glimpse as much as we can of this very eroded inscription. Now, here's another great example. It's a, a panel at Dumbarton Oaks, uh, one of the objects, objects that we scanned as part of our work on the catalog. And of course, um, the reason that we won that amazing award because we were an amazing team of uh, specialists. There are several dozen people working on this catalog. All my uh, uh, co-editors, uh, John Pillsbury, the leader of the project, What's, what is amazing about this particular case is that a 3D scan can highlight certain parts of the image which are very hard to see with optical light. We're talking about topography here, not texture. Texture is sometimes of a, more of a problem because the surface texture can change over time. What you need is essentially a visualization of surface topography that allows you to see the carved features better. And so in this particular case, we could actually notice and, and depict more accurately tiny uh, glyphs on the skirt of the protagonist. And it's actually the only reference to a term for skirt uh, in classic Maya inscriptions carved on a, an actual skirt depicted on a monument. So presumably had an inscribed skirt, an inscribed loincloth, and the artist faithfully represented uh, that. And so we have a term, uh, we have a reference to it, and we have an actual object. So it's a very fascinating example of how uh, a 3D scan can actually facilitate uh, studying an object. Uh, now, uh, most of the examples that you're going to see, we may use a structured light scanner, and I'm not a specialist, I'm just a user. Uh, there are different types of uh, 3D digitizing equipment. You may have heard of laser, uh, you just heard about a new technology that basically uses a time of flight effect, uh, some laser scanners, uh, LIDAR says there are no, also use time of flight. Uh, structured light is a triangulation system, so it is positioned relatively close to the object. Uh, uh, there is a camera or a couple of cameras and a projecting unit at an angle to each other, and then project a, uh, is uses, simple, uses simple white light, and it projects certain uh, patterns onto the surface, and then uh, images of gray code, phase shift, and contrast are then used to interpret the information received by the digital camera and turn it into a, an array of points in a, a 3D point cloud, which are then uh, transformed into a, a surface, into topography visualization. So here's a, our scan in action. You can see those distinctive patterns uh, project onto the surface. It's an optical scanning method, as any optical scanning method it has its limitations. Uh, if there's too much light, uh, the scanner cannot see the contrast uh, patterns mm -hmm. very well. If the surface is highly reflective or highly contrastive, uh, we have also uh, obvious problems. So it's not necessarily a technique for everything. But in contrast to some other scanning techniques, uh, for just documenting the topography uh, of the object. It offers amazing resolution. It's also pretty fast. So it's a good technique to, to use in the field when you really uh, uh, have to budget your time. And it's also a good technique when you really want high quality resolution for 
conservation purpose or for your research. This is our flagship project. It took us several years. Uh, this is the famous hieroglyphic stairway of Copan. It's the longest surviving inscription in the Americas and one of the largest texts in the world as, for, as far as this overall scale of this thing. So it's a stairway of a temple inscribed with characters. And unfortunately, because uh, of relatively bad uh, conservation decisions now more than 80 years ago when this <coughs> monument was reassembled uh, from its sort of damaged collapse state and became a waterfall every uh, rainy season. Uh, no matter what we do today, and you can see cables from a roof that now covers it, and there was a Getty uh, Conservation Institute study uh, of, of these blocks. No matter what we do, the erosion caused by these bad conservation decisions, by the damage caused uh, by the exposure, uh, by a, uh, at some point unsuccessful bleach attempt, um, and other factors, the fact that people were, were actually walking on those steps for several decades before the stairway was closed to the public. Uh, so uh, no matter what we do now, the surface erosion is going to continue and the surface loss of this monument is going to continue. Uh, not at an, an accelerated rate, uh, perhaps 30, as 30 years ago, but uh, the current state is a transient state. And so our goal was to document it to the best of our technology, to the best of our ability today, to just have something for future generations uh, to have, but also to be able to monitor the overall uh, erosion in the future, say within 10 or 20 years, in a, in a more accurate way than with just photographs. So here's our um, project. And you can imagine it was quite a challenge to move the scanner on those relatively steep steps. Uh, and it was a team effort. Of course, we had to train uh, local folks to use the software, uh, the hardware. Uh, we're supported by various institutions, including Banco Santander, uh, the local Institute of Anthropology and History. Uh, and eventually, we succeeded. So we have the stairway. <coughs> This is the lower section, is a 3D uh, visualization of the lower section of the stairway. Uh, the rest of the monument is completely out of order. The, the current reconstruction is wrong, we know it. Unfortunately, for the conservation reasons, there's nothing we can do with the physical monument. We cannot rearrange the blocks, we cannot rearrange the sculptures. It's just too damaging. Uh, uh, this solution is not going to work. They're also embedded in concrete with probably some iron armatures in it. So there's no way we're going to touch the real blocks. Initially, we thought we would do uh, the whole new reconstruction digitally and then 3D print it. Uh, after about a year of trying, we decided that our data was simply too heavy. There was too much to visualize to be able to operate uh, blocks in 3D digitally. Also, the, uh, the techniques that we have with available software are not particularly good at trying to move things in three dimensions. No, no stereo goggles. You cannot really touch things and move them. So, uh, now, uh, just as some other projects work in the Americas, what we do, we print things at scale. So we create our Lego set of uh, hieroglyphic stairway blocks and different pieces of the stairway. And so as we print it gradually, we're going to create a new uh, reconstruction of this monument at one tenth of uh, uh, the actual scale. And uh, I think uh, uh, during the demonstration, you can look at some of the 3D prints of the blocks if, if you're interested. So this is this, the current state. It's the the construction state. We print those blocks, uh, we play with them. I know there's a similar project in South America working with, uh, uh, with uh, some of the Tiwanaku sculptures. So this is what we can do with uh, the available technology. Now, as you can imagine, scanning in Central America is quite a challenge. So it's, it's about jungles, trucks, uh, store new equipment, which is a challenge when you have some high-tech tools which are very vulnerable to moisture, uh, water, uh, and uh, dust. So have to be very careful, you have to have good protocols, good procedures to deal with those issues. And you work in things like tunnels. Uh, so here's a tunnel excavation, an amazing uh, 7th century, uh, late 6th century, early 7th century stucco frieze on the roof of a building, completely buried by a later structure. And so you see how narrow that tunnel is. It's less than a meter wide. So we were, we were actually able to bring our equipment inside that tunnel the laptop, uh, the scanner, uh, the cables, and then scan the whole thing. That was actually a good, uh, a good comparison of different documentation techniques. What you see now is the visualization of uh, the freeze done with our scanner, both uh, with color, texture, and without. The only thing you see is basically the geometry and uh, the light that highlights it. 
We could also compare different modes of documentation. So uh, when the freeze was just found, I was able to do a photo mosaic and then drawing based on it. Uh, and so you can see a comparison of that uh, with the 3D scan and rather systematic distortion introduced by the angle of my camera. And when I was shooting in that tunnel, of course, I could not shoot straight uh, at the images. The tunnel was very narrow towards the top. Uh, below, you see the drawing based on measurements. So uh, my colleague was about the same time working with uh, uh, measuring lines and uh, a drawing board. Once again, the distortion is not as systematic, but you can see some substantial differences between the 3D scan and an actual drawing. So even in terms of trying to properly document things, there's a huge advantage in, in 3D imaging, not to mention the fact that we can replicate the entire roof of this temple. It's eight and a half meters by two and a half meters. If we want to, we can create a scaled model. And we don't know if it is going to stay that way. It is incredibly fra fragile stucco. And uh, the, the entire third of it has been identified by uh, a conservation specialist who can actually see in the, in the image working with us as potentially uh, highly vulnerable. So we don't know what's going to happen to these freeze. Uh, even in the near future, not to mention in the long term, we may even have to bury it uh, back uh, uh, to make sure that it, it is preserved. Um, and then um, imagine that there are objects like that, and how do we want to make them, say, uh, available to scholars who want to study these things, or how we want to make them available to the public? Here's a rare visit of a field school to, to the tunnels of Copan. They're trying to take shots of... Um, of one of these beautiful painted stucco panels. Uh, this is from a structure called Margarita. Uh, it's a very narrow tunnel. Uh, so I don't know what they're going to capture. I mean, even with a good camera, that's all you can get unless you do some photo mosaic uh, um, uh, effort. So we've scanned it. And then uh, we actually wanted it to become a part of an exhibit. Uh, UPAN Museum was doing an exhibit, Myers, uh, Lords of Time, uh, for the 2012 uh, uh, thing. And so, uh, the printing was outsourced to Digital Atelier, and the company did a pretty good job. So here's our scan. You can see they had to mill it in several sections, then uh, paint it by hand, unfortunately, because the milling process, uh, you can't really uh, automate uh, the transmission of color yet. So you have to drill some objects like a, a piece of resin or uh, industrial wax, and then you have to apply paint uh, by hand. Uh, and so here's me standing next to um, a model, a 3D print, essentially. And you can actually see it from an angle as it was intended to be seen. That's actually a base level, a foundation of a temple. So uh, it was never meant to be seen in a tunnel from really up close. It's a piece of monumental art that, in, fa in fact, represents uh, the name of the ruler of the dynasty, the founder of the dynasty, Kini these are These are glyphs, huge glyphs. Uh, and it is surrounded by representation of the sky. So it's the name of the ruler, like a huge emblem in the midst of the sky. And so it was meant to be seen from a certain distance. Uh, it was meant to be monumental. There's no way you can experience it in the tunnel today. And of course, there's no way we can allow people to experience it because their presence was the fact the microclimate of the tunnels, the humidity, uh, uh, the, 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 the composition of uh, the air uh, in the tunnels and, and the fungi that will all damage the stucco. We also know that the stucco is uh, being gradually uh, destroyed by the deformation of the wall. The wall is now bending because of that tunnel. The distribution of the weight in, uh, within the mass of the acropolis is changing. And we have to reinsert uh, uh, stabilizing material into the stucco now because it's basically uh, poking off the wall gradually, very gradually. We're talking about things which you know, happen on a time scale of you know, 10, 20 years, uh, and then 30 years, 40 years. But we are archaeologists. That thing was in that tunnel for a millennium and nothing happened to it. Now we have excavated it and it is effectively endangered even though it's not going to happen very fast. Another great example of working with fragile things. Uh, these are so-called eccentric flints, perhaps the most elaborate things ever made from flint stone ever using a uh, traditional napping technique. They're also covered in textiles so they couldn't be properly studied, especially the site underneath. So we scan those things. Uh, essentially you bring them from a storage, it takes about uh, a minute, because it's about 20 minutes away. Uh, we place them in our office uh, in the research center in Honduras. We scan them, uh, changing the supports uh, uh, both underneath and above. And you end up with images which can actually be studied, can be measured, can be drawn properly. And uh, we're going to publish those things uh, in a few years. 
So this is an example of how our technology actually allows uh, us to study things. Here's a 3D model of one of those beautiful objects. Can you see the textiles as well? So this site cannot be, could not be drawn, uh, could not be documented, measured properly until we scan this object because it could not be handled except in a horizontal position so you wouldn't damage the preserved piece of textile. Those things were wrapped in some kind of bundle and so of course the bundle partially eroded the parts of it. Uh, one of the largest bits of pre-Columbian textile that we have uh, in the world, I mean in this part of the world where things don't get preserved so well, we're not in South America, we're not in the desert, we're in the tropical rainforest. Uh, and then you can use, you can use techniques like uh, a reflect, uh, uh, like radiance uh, scaling to be able to visualize the topography, once again assisting in the scientific study of uh, these tools. So, so lithic special, special space and sheets actually using these images to produce technical drawings of uh, those flints. Uh, one of the projects a little bit closer to home is Harvard uh, uh, Tercentenary Steel. This amazing monument uh, is also endangered, like anything that stands in the open air. The, the, the rains uh, uh, in, in the 20th century became more acidic. It's just the basic reality. We live in an industrial world. We dump all this carbon uh, into the atmosphere and it ends up in uh, you know, slightly more acidic rainwater. This is a marble monument, so it is continuously damaged. Uh, right now, it's, it is, um, the practice is to shelter it during the worst months, uh, the winter, parts of the spring, and parts of the fall. But ideally, uh, it would be great to move it indoors. Uh, and of course, part of this effort is to create uh, a replica, to create a, a copy. And that's what we have done. Uh, we actually got some press coverage from Harvard Gazette, Harvard Magazine. Uh, but here's uh, the process of scanning uh, the actual monument using our scanner. And uh, this is the result, uh, the screenshots of the model, uh, about one third of a millimeter resolution. Uh, so you can create a relatively accurate uh, copy, not a, a perfectly accurate, but uh, very closely. Uh, so just a detail of uh, the actual inscription. So the plan is to replicate it and perhaps even create copies which could be moved back to China. This monument carries a special symbolic significance as a sign of uh, friendship, of collaboration, the importance of scholarship both here in the United States at Harvard, but also in China. So Harvard uh, Shanghai Center wants a copy of at least uh, the inscription on the stele. So here's an example of, this is a low res visualization, but you can see it looks still pretty good. The last project that I want to discuss is uh, the Horsabat port that we just did this summer. Uh, this is a collaboration with the Harvard Semitic Museum. We, want to scan, uh, we wanted to scan two Assyrian sculptures in the Horsabat court in the Louvre Museum and create full-sized replicas for our galleries here at the Semitic Museum. So uh, the replication process is a little, uh, uh, I think it's still, still uh, in the air because we're looking for the funds uh, to pay for the 3D printing. Uh, but uh, it was still quite a challenge to uh, scan these enormous monuments uh, in an environment which is pretty bad for structured light scanning. There's a lot of light, as you can see. So we had to use tents, very tall tents, uh, five and a half meter tall tents uh, in, uh, in this courtyard to be able to document the monuments, uh, which we succeeded. And um, so here's the process. Here's my uh, Honduran colleague who traveled with me. Uh, and you see the, the process of using relatively tall camera crane. They, of course, would not allow us to use any kind of scaffolding uh, or mechanical devices in uh, the lower museum. So we had to improvise and use those, one of those tall cranes, usually reserved for video productions, uh, and um, mount our scanner on top of it. And these are some of the results. You can see the, the, the details of the cuneiform inscription, just a little section of one of the winged bulls that we scanned. So once again, it's about a third millimeter resolution and came out very well. We also had a chance to compare uh, different techniques of documentation. So just before we scanned, uh, scanned it used our, using our structured light scanner, there was a German project that used photogrammetry, uh, the edgy soft software. So here's the result of the photogrammetry. So there's a substantial difference, even if you compare it with highly downsampled to image of our 3D scan. Well, the, the difference is primarily precision and accuracy. It's not so much about resolution, the density of the points, uh, in part because it's a brightly lit courtyard, it's very hard to get proper angles since it's a very large sculpture, 
uh, photogrammetry uh, does not offer the same level of precision. So you want to use uh, a photogrammetry derived model for an accurate 3D print. So uh, this is what you will have. Uh, and this is what uh, we produced using a structured light scanner. So it's an actual physical comparison. I'm not necessarily judging the method. Uh, I, I talked to some people with, uh, using edges stuff, and they told me perhaps these, fo uh, these photographs were not taken uh, properly. I, I don't know. But I just have this actual comparison of 3D data uh, derived by a project uh, just a few months before us and our current structured light uh, scan of uh, the same monument. Uh, finally, and I'm really sorry, my presentation is taking a little longer than I planned. Uh, you can share 3D data, uh, di different means. Uh, uh, my current favorite is Sketchfab that I'm using, uh, that you just saw some of the Sketchfab images. I'm teaching a course in MyGlyphs right now, and I'm teaching a distance learning course. So I cannot take these students to the Peabody Museum. Some of, some of them, they don't even live in the United States. So how do I share my passion uh, for Maya monuments, uh, the complexity of uh, the visual imagery, um, its distribution on the surface, uh, uh, the, the, how these things uh, are supposed to be perceived uh, with them. And, and so I'm using 3D gallery uh, to, um, to communicate that. Uh, and you don't even have to have a fancy 3D scanner to do that. The image on the right is actually, I'm not going to open it because I think I'm running out of time. But uh, it, I actually derived with a, with a free uh, application for a cell phone. It's called 123D Catch. They shoot relatively nice 3D images uh, with that software. And I know some of my colleagues, uh, like Heather McKillop and now basically incorporate, they have incorporated this application to their curriculum. So they're teaching students how to use it because it's a very simple app that allows you to use photogrammetry to capture 3D and um, uh, familiarize you with the process of uh, creating 3D images. So <laughs> unfortunately, I would very much like to have some kind of immersive uh, virtual reality. The Sketchfab uh, is a free application uh, for now. They also promise integration with products like Google uh, Cardboard. Unfortunately, uh, it's actually not working. Um, so I, um, I initially thought that I would simply tell my students to buy uh, Google Cardboard. It's only like 15 bucks. Then you insert your own smartphone and you have your own 3D stereo set. Uh, but all my models look like 3D balloons. They don't look like uh, the, all the geometry is, for, for some reason, not adjusting to the different screen uh, resolutions of smartphones. But that's the future, of course, to be able to move beyond uh, just opening a file uh, on a screen uh, and it, you know, create some kind of immersive environment, which of course takes us to important questions, uh, how we store these things. And uh, I already talked to some of my colleagues here. And it's, it's, an, it's a question that probably deserves a discussion at the panel. Uh, because when you have a large institution with a long-term storage uh, plan, with a long-term commitment, uh, then perhaps uh, there, there is a place uh, for 3D data, because uh, you basically have to renew it, you have to make sure you can still open those files, you have to make sure that the files are still uh, um, functional, uh, that there's no error. Uh, but if it's just a single project, um, then it is quite possible that no data would be preserved. We share all our data, say, with Guatemalan and Honduran uh, institutions, but because they have no long-term no long 3D sort of policy, uh, 3D commitment in place, our files are just getting lost. So National Museum of Guatemala no longer has our files because their director changed twice since, uh, since we shared our fi files. There's no person in charge uh, with respect to digital archives. And then uh, within the Guatemalan research community, it essentially varies from project to project. Some projects are relatively good in doing that, others are not. So it's a very important question. Sharing is important. A licensing is a, very, is a highly important Thing. How, as a museum, we license uh, these things? I mean, we can license images. We, we are pretty good at that. We can license, we can loan uh, objects. But what about 3D? Because it's not just an image, right? It's a tool for generating an endless amount of images. You can do anything you want. You can generate uh, shots, which are actually practically impossible to create using conventional photography. And then on top of that, you can also replicate. Um, so. Uh, for now, we don't have a policy as a museum how to deal with that. It's basically at, on an ad hoc basis and based on the trust that we have towards the institutions like the Penn Museum that used our data for a 3D replication. So we know these people, we trust them, we know they're not going to run away and, and start printing little margarita panels on coffee mugs or something. <laughs> and then there's a question of high resolution data. Uh, for now, all the models you've seen are relatively low res. So it's a, it's a whole question of how you integrate high resolution data that we want as scholars with the actual capacity, say, of the internet, which is pretty low res. 
And I don't have answers uh, to, to those uh, questions because I'm just a user. But I would very much like to hear what other members uh, of the panel or perhaps people in uh, this room uh, might uh, suggest. And of course, this is a large endeavor, it's a large acknowledgement phase. What I want to highlight, there's so many people from Honduras who have been part of the project and uh, worked with us, and we really appreciate all their efforts to preserve their cultural heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So, we heard about uh, 3D imaging, but also 3D printing. We, of course, went to a different time period and different materials. We were hearing again about teamwork, collaboration, and uh, Alex also was talking about access for public and sharing the data that we are creating.